Welcome to Public Health Matters, where we talk about the matters of public health. And welcome to this new year. We're hoping that it's going to be a better new year than last year. We're still dealing with the impact of COVID-19, the coronavirus, in our communities. This afternoon, I have two special guests with me that are going to talk about what things are going on at our hospitals. Andrea Erickson is the Vice President of Patient Care and the Chief Nursing Officer at St. Joseph's Hospital. Welcome. Thank you. And Dr. Tim Scherer is the Chief Medical Officer and Gastroenterologist at Southern New Hampshire Medical Center. Welcome. Thank you. So you've heard on the news, we are doing our daily updates. You're probably meeting on a daily basis at the hospital as things unfold with things happening with uh, COVID. Our numbers in New Hampshire and Nashua continue to increase. I think we've had probably, um, what the epidemiologist did some numbers for us, and we've had over 134% increase in cases since the holidays, of which we expected, right? So we projected that during the holiday season, we were going to see an uptick in cases after Thanksgiving and after Christmas. And we tried to put some mitigative measures in place to try and slow those numbers down. But we're not seeing that happen. As of uh, yesterday, total cumulative cases in New Hampshire are at 233,508. Active cases in the state, 22,750. And the test positivity rate right now is at 22.2%. So almost one in four cases that are, uh, tests that are performed are coming back positive. And this is the number that's the most disturbing for us is that right now there are 432 individuals that are in the hospital in the state. And we know that data is being collected from all of our hospitals. And so we want to talk a little bit more about what's happening down here in Nashua in our two hospitals. What does it look like? How are things um, panning out for you on the front lines day in and day out? And this has got to be hard for you all. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how things are going? And let's start with, let's start with Southern first. Sure. Um it's the system's taxed. Um, there are many sick patients in the hospital right now. In fact, 36 COVID patients are admitted into our hospital, and we have three additional patients that have recovered from COVID but are still in the hospital because of other issues. Um, just to put it in perspective, Southern New Hampshire Medical Center is a 188 bed acute care facility. But not all of those beds are for patients with medical issues. Many of those beds are for other things, pediatrics, our um, special care nursery, mm -hmm. labor and delivery. We have about 108 beds overall to deal with medical surgical patients. In addition, we have 11 beds to deal with patients with, a, with uh, intensive care needs. Staffing has been a challenge. There are many people who have decided they no longer want to participate in hospital-based care. Yeah. Nurses, nursing assistants, a, a number of different people. So that 108 bed capacity drops down to about 80 to 85. So now all of a sudden. Wait, you said something that's really important there. Mm -hmm. So because of that capacity, the number of individuals that can actually be in the hospital in the beds has decreased significantly. I don't think people understand that. Correct. Yeah, we, we have probably uh, 10, we're probably down 10 to 15 beds right now, which is an improvement for us. And the reason why we're only down 10 to 15 from what our baseline has been mm -hmm. is because we have stopped performing elective surgeries. We've, we've cut down on what we're doing. So we're really only performing surgeries on people who have devastating diagnoses, cancers, things of that nature mm -hmm. that they can't wait. And we've taken the rest of those nurses from endoscopy and the perioperative services, and we've put them onto the medical surgical floors to help care for patients so that we can have patients be seen and cared for in a timely fashion, which can be frustrating when people right. wanna have their surgeries. Right. Yeah. And so, but so even with that, we're still not at what our baseline number of available beds are. And that's really difficult um, because we wanna be able to uh, get patients out of the emergency room and up to the floors. And many times those patients are waiting in the emergency rooms for a bed 
And when those beds in the emergency room are occupied by patients waiting f to go upstairs, we can't get people in from the waiting room. Yeah. And so it can be frustrating with extremely long waits in the waiting room for the emergency department. So, so it's stressed. It's a very stressed system. Uh, and I think that we're doing the best that we can in order to ensure that we care for the community the best that we can. And we will always be here for the community. Right. Uh, it's trying to figure out how to, how to manage that when people are tired. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been working a lot. People are working uh, more than what they typically would work. Sometimes people work 60 to 80 hours in a week in order to try and help close the gap so that we can care for our patients. And, and uh, so I would say that it's, it's difficult. Yeah. The one other thing I want to mention that's really important is that there was an article that uh, came out today that showed that the ICU capacity in the country is very limited. In New Hampshire is one of four states in the country that has less than 10% of its baseline ICU beds available for care of patients. Yeah. One of four. And so um, I think that that just tells you. Right, um, and that's been going on for a while. Yes. Now, so, um, St. Joe's and Southern are only about a mile apart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if a person goes up to or down to Southern and the ED is packed, they're going to come up to St. Joe's. So tell us about what's happening in St. Joe's, Andrea. Thank you. So it's very similar for what's happening down the street. Um, our emergency room is a 23-bed emergency room, and it's mm -hmm. chocker block full. A lot of it is capacity up on the inpatient unit, whether it's med surge level of care or ICU level of care. We have a 10-bed ICU, and we've actually had to spill over and have ICU patients um, up on our med surge floor and actually board med um, ICU patients down in the emergency department. So when you have capacity that's limited, in your emergency department, it's very, very challenging to get those patients in out of your waiting room. And so you run the risk of having those patients leave your, your hospital, which is called left without being seen, so they can go down the street and try to seek care somewhere else. And you never want to have your patients leave your emergency department because you don't want to put anyone at risk. Um, but the, the staff are exhausted. Um, they're working really hard. We, we're calling it that great resignation. Um, people that are close to retirement, they've chosen to do so. You have newer nurses, newer graduates um, that I really feel um, it, they've been, they're not a, they're kind of at a disadvantage for when they graduated during COVID. They didn't have the clinicals that they normally would have. Right, right. Um, so it's, it's not just this, the last two months I feel have been really challenging. It's the last two years when you put it all together, it's really, we're just really feeling the strain of it right now. Um, but people are really digging in, working hard. Um, the good old fashioned team-based nursing model is how we're really being successful in, in caring for the patients in our community, where we have the ICU skill set specific with those experienced med surge nurses caring for our, our very sick and vulnerable. And when you have all these patients in your department, it's not just COVID patients that we have to care for. Right, we still have right. the strokes and those heart attack patients that need acute um, interventions or your septic patients or the patients requiring emergent surgery. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really how do we care for all patients in our community that need our services? Right. So let's talk a little bit more about both of those things, about uh, the patients that come in that have COVID, about the patients that come in that have other things that it may be a stroke or it might be a heart attack. And how does that, how does that, um, you know, play out in the hospital setting? Because you have to make certain, you have to prioritize uh, certain things. And if we're talking about staffing capacity being strained, what does that look like um, in the hospital setting right now? I mean, my experience with it is that uh, first, you have to get the patient in to be seen, and so there's a lot of work done on the triage side to be able to sift through and find those patients who are really requiring immediate help. Mm -hmm. And then when you identify it, you figure it out. And there's a lot of shifting. Our nursing supervisors are always trying to create space so that we can um, put a patient where they need to be and get the care that they need to get, whether it's a, a heart attack that requires a catheterization mm -hmm. um, or if it's a stroke patient. Um, uh, ultimately, we'll find a place for those folks to be, but sometimes it backs up into the emergency department. Um, I think that it's, I think the other 
aspect of this is that many patients during COVID did not get the medical care for their chronic conditions that they needed. Yes. And so that delay in care sometimes promotes someone's illness to get worse and then they wind up having hospitalization. So despite the fact that our ICU um, has had some overflow and we've had to create a second ICU, um, half of those patients are COVID, but half of those patients aren't. And if you considered the average typical ICU census prior to COVID, mm -hmm. it's higher now with those non-COVID related right, concerns. Right. So there's a there's an unanticipated uh, consequence of COVID in the non-COVID medicine uh, management. Now, and what is, how is this playing out for the staff? Because you mentioned the longer hours that people are working. You have more people that are choosing to retire because they're at that place. And then you've got the newer nurses that may not have as much experience. And you're dealing with this, this balancing of this prioritizing of, uh, you know, how the care will be delivered. How is that playing out for the staff at the nursing level all the way up? Well, I think, you know, it, we stood up our internal code white, and I'm sure you did as well. So it's all hands on deck, looking at your staffing grids, looking at your complement of staffing. How do we flex? And it's all about being nimble mm -hmm. during this time. And how do we how do we ebb and flow with our patient volume, our census, our acuity? And it might change every four hours, every eight hours. So it's really looking at that complement of staffing and how do we adjust? Um, we've had to utilize agency agency travelers or, or temporary agency in our, in our hospital to supplement, um, which is a benefit and we need to bring those nurses in. Great skill set. Um, but again, we want to attract and, and attain our own staff. Yeah. But that's been a challenge right now. We're in a very competitive market. Mm -hmm. Southern is one mile down Kinsley Street, but we also have you know, the Manchester hospitals in our market, the I-93 corridor down into Massachusetts. We, we're five, min, five miles from Massachusetts, completely different market, which I think is a that's struggle hard. for that's Nashville. That's hard for New Hampshire, period. It really is. <laughs> right, because you can go right over the border um, and the difference in your pay is going to be, you know, pretty significant. Correct. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, in the treatment for uh, COVID patients, right? So there's there's a lot of information uh, that we really want our public and our community to know about as far as um, some of the things that we have to help take care of people. And we have some therapeutics that have come on the scene right now, which goes into our armament. So we've got mm -hmm. our masks that we really want people to wear to stop the spread of the virus in the community. And that's so important. We've got vaccinations and boosters now. And now there's um, more therapeutics that are coming on the scene. Let's talk a little bit about that. And how is that going to be helpful with us in this, this crunch period that we're in? Because we've had this large increase in cases. Today it was reported out that in Nashville we have over 3,000 3, 3, cases that were reported today. So you know in a couple of weeks what that might look like for the hospitals. Mm -hmm. How are these therapeutics going to be helpful? I think the most interesting piece is that it shifts. Um, Delta had different options available to us that don't necessarily work with Omicron. And we've seen a dramatic shift in the past two weeks of what we're diagnosing in New Hampshire. We went from 10% um, of Omicron being newly diagnosed mm -hmm. up to over 80%. And so with that shift, the historical monoclonal antibodies that we use are no longer helpful. And so we're shifting to a new monoclonal antibody that's available. And the concept is supposed to be that if you have significant risk to progress to severe disease, and if you have onset of symptoms and you get an infusion of this antibody within 10 days of the onset of symptoms, you may decrease the likelihood of progression of severe disease and needing the hospital. That's awesome. And so identification of who's high risk to go and access to the infusion, uh, I think are gonna be you know, very important to try and not overtax the already overtaxed health systems. Antivirals. Um, that are oral agents will be next, same sort of category, people who are high risk to progress to disease. Mm -hmm. If they get identified within five days of the onset of symptoms and they can get access to these antivirals, 
um, you have a reduction in requirements for hospitalization. These are the sorts of things that are, go that are going to help keep people as well as possible and to help prevent them from needing hospital-based services and running the risk of significant morbidity and even mortality. Yeah, so yeah. I think that this part's important. And, and right now, I think that we're all trying to um, operationalize getting these medications to people um, as, we, as we receive the medications. Yeah, and then how do, you, how do you prioritize who those patients are? So for instance, you know, we've known that um, you know, COVID doesn't do the same thing in, in everyone. There are some folks that are asymptomatic. Some people have very mild symptoms. Who's a candidate for these therapeutics? Um, if, it depends on your comorbidities. Um, if yeah. you wind up having a history of heart disease, whether yeah. it's congenital heart disease or mm -hmm. otherwise congestive heart failure, if you're uh, COPD, if you're immunosuppressed, okay. um, these are the sorts of folks that are the higher risk to progress, and those are the ones that should be prioritized to uh, to be available under this. And, and that's part of the indications under emergency use authorization is this, this category of people mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that really should be considered for these treatments. And it is pulling them, those patients out of your emergency department and scheduling them. We have a clinic, Southern has a clinic as well. So you're freeing up space out of your emergency department for patients that need emergency care. So um, recognizing that these patients do need this type of therapy, Scheduling them in, but pulling them out of your department for capacity is also very helpful. Now, let's also talk about the emergency room. Who should not be going? So I know that our testing uh, sites have been slammed mm -hmm. to the point where uh, right now, in fact, today, the testing site that was scheduled over at 261 Lake Street has now moved over to 25 Crown Street. So that's where that new location will be. Um, there have been people that have been turned away because the demand for testing has gotten so high. Then we're hearing that they're going to the emergency room. What do you want our community to know about that? Should people be going to the emergency room for testing? I would never want to say that someone cannot go to the emergency department if they feel that they need emergency care. But if it's just random routine testing, I would say go to your urgent cares first to utilize testing to free up an emergency department. You might find that you'll be waiting there for long periods of time for routine testing, especially if it's that testing to get back to school, to get back to work. Or to travel. Or to travel, um, make an appointment and get the those PCR tests or if you can secure an antigen test somewhere. If it is an emergency and you feel that you really, you know, you're sh struggling for shortness of breath, absolutely. Those are the times to utilize your emergency department. But for random routine testing, utilize your urgent cares or different off-site testing. Right. And there's also the testing that's available through the state website. So we definitely want people to go on to COVID19NH.gov, order the tests, have them and then use them appropriately. So we're strongly encouraging folks that if you've been a contact to a case and you don't have signs and symptoms to wait the five days and then use the test. If they have symptoms, they should go ahead and use the test. And don't go, I, I mean, as a public health person, I'm gonna say, because we're trying to protect that resource at the emergency room, we're trying to really divert people from going there just for testing, Yes. not for other things, as you mentioned, Andrea. Truly, if a person has um, they're having chest pain, they've been in an accident, they've, snow's coming, they do something with those snow blowers, which we know those are the things that, you know, happen, um, you know, the, the, the cardiovascular events that happen. Yes, we definitely want those folks to go to the emergency room and not be afraid to go because they're afraid they may pick up um, COVID. But if it's just for testing, we definitely don't want them to go to the and, emergency room. And I would room. encourage people also to follow the CDC guidelines if they have been exposed to COVID. Um, and sometimes when you get exposed, you have that knee-jerk reaction. I want to go get tested. Yes. And so I that. and so I would suggest that you know the CDC guidelines are pretty clear about: Do you quarantine yourself, or do you not quarantine yourself based on your uh, vaccination status, or if you've had COVID in the past 90 days? You know, the testing really from there is at day five. If you test too early chances are pretty high that it's going to be negative. Right. And so that day five is the day to do testing then. So I wouldn't want to double test. Right. So I think, you know, being thoughtful about those CDC guidelines is helpful. And, the, and understanding how the tests work. So there's this uh, sensitivity level of the test as well, right? Mm -hmm. So you 
the test is going to pick up how much virus is there. So if the, if the virus is very, very low, it's not going to pick it up. So that five day is really important in following those instructions that are given by the CDC guidelines as well. Yes, thank you. So tell me a little bit about, we talked about what's going on in the hospitals right now. We're hearing about uh, staff being stressed. What does that look like? Um, we really want our community to understand what does that mean? So you say it's stress, like I, I can get stressed waiting for the light to change. We know we're not talking about that kind of stress. What are we talking about when we say that our hospitals are stressed, staffing is stressed? What does that look like? What are you guys seeing? Because you, you are the staff. I, I have been in nursing for 25 years and I've never seen anything like what I've seen in the last, you know, two to three months of very sick patients, um, full ICUs for a community-based hospital. Our patients that we have seen um, with COVID have been, that have been very challenging for us, have been unvaccinated, um, ages between 40 to 60 years mm -hmm. of age. And when you see patients that are not getting better, because usually, you know, and you do see patients in your ICU, not all get better, but you usually see progression and people do get better. When you see week over week that your patient population is not progressing and getting better, it, that is very challenging for your staff. Um, actually having crisis relief teams coming in to, to help with our staff because they're really struggling with watching patients pass away and die at a very young age. It's not the norm in healthcare. Um, and unfortunately for the past so many months, this has become the norm for them. And we need to provide that emotional support to help get them through this. Because if we don't as healthcare leaders and we don't provide that, they're, they're going to leave the profession. And, you know, you've seen it in your military, you've seen it in your first responders. We need to provide that emotional and mental support for them because this is something they've never experienced before. Right, yeah, and thank you for sharing that. Um, this is the first pandemic that many of us, uh, you know, are living through because we're still in it. And if we could just get that message out of the importance of our community working together because we're, we're all a part of this community, whether we're working in um, you know, the healthcare arena, a part of that system, a nonprofit and public health, we're all a part of the community and we all have to work together to get past all of this. And a crisis is usually short lived, right? Yeah. Like six weeks, yeah. all hands on deck. Um, when the pandemic first hit and you remember back to New, New York City with the pots and pans, mm -hmm. healthcare workers were in the midst of it. They were our superheroes. Now we're two years in and they feel kind of defeated, right, I would right. say. Um, and it's been a long time. And um, I don't know if they, f I feel like they maybe feel there's no end in sight for them right now. Yeah. I think we feel like that in public health mm -hmm. as well. I mean, we're all a part of the same system, the public health system. Yes. And I think we are beginning to feel like that, but there's hope, right? We've seen the, you know, the ebbing, we've seen uh, the beginning of the pandemic, then we saw the leveling out. We saw the rise again, we saw the leveling out. Now we've got all of these things in our armament to work with us. So we will get to that point where there will be that leveling out once again. So I'm hoping that we all can just hold on and not give up hope and have our community again support us in our work by doing the things that will help us get past this pandemic. I, I, I agree with that. And, you know, the, one other aspect that is interesting that's a new dynamic Many times when we would have patients show up with very acute illness and they need tertiary or quaternary level services, usually you pick up the phone and you make a phone call and next thing you know, you've got a bed available at one of those facilities. That's not the case anymore. Yeah. And so we are figuring out um, how to best utilize our resources to take care of patients that historically wouldn't be in the hospital for that level of care. And um, our teams have responded magnificently but it's not something that we would have been, you know, forced to, to have to contend with two or three years ago. 
And so that makes people pretty stressed out and pretty uncomfortable. Um, many people in the hospital also are, are, you know, earlier in their careers. And um, I think your point was well taken that they're not used to seeing the amount of, of death that they've had to see. Yeah. And I've seen people who are as tough as nails reduced to tears. And it happens with a high frequency. It's usually, you know, taking somebody aside and talking with them um, and just reassuring them and listening. Uh, and it, it happens all too frequently. And, um, you know, it's heartbreaking for everybody. It's stressful as, as a leader. Mm -hmm. um, it's stressful because you feel for these people because these people are your family. Right. And, and, you, and, and not only that, but you, you know, we need to keep them, you know, uh, focused on caring for the patients and caring for the community, which is why we're here. I mean, it's, it's, it's very stressful and uh, we're dedicated, but, you know, people are, they're requiring a little TLC. Right. What is one thing that you'd like to leave what, um, with our community today? I'd like to say that we're dedicated. We're here for you. It's hard. And, you know, we're going to be here to do our part. We'd love to have people do a couple of things to, to try and help us, which is make sure that you follow up with your primary care doc with your chronic illnesses to make sure that they're managed so you don't need to use the emergency department. Mm -hmm. Vaccination is very effective. If you do have symptoms, um, you know, trying to, especially if you're high risk to progress the disease, if we can identify you a little bit earlier and get some treatment for you a little bit earlier, um, it may make the difference of needing to be hospitalized or not. And lastly, you know, I, I think being kind to one another. I think it's a pretty stressful time for everybody, and I think that that's important. Yeah, I agree. And it's, it's that compassion. I think compassion fatigue is, is there. Um, and when you're, you are visiting the emergency department and there are some delays, be kind to those pro those people taking care of you. It's easy, you know, you said when you're at the light you get frustrated. It's easy to get frustrated in there. So just remember that everyone's working really hard and we are there for the community and we will mm -hmm. remain that mm -hmm. to, be, to be committed to the community. Well, we definitely in public health want to thank you. Um, both hospitals have been partners with us throughout this entire um, pandemic. We've worked um, tirelessly for the past two years, you know, together um, in different capacities on the front line in different ways. But our hearts go out to you because you guys are right there seeing everything on a daily basis, working, um, you know, right there with the patients, with their families. And uh, we just want to just continue to give you all that you all need to get the work done in the best way possible. And... Um, you know, take care of yourselves. Thank you know, you. The, the, Thank you. the best way that we can all bring our best, you know, to our jobs is to take care of ourselves. And so thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for all of the work that you're doing to help keep our communities healthy and safe. You're welcome. And, and we'll be here for you. Absolutely. Thank you. And through this whole thing, our two hospitals have worked very well together. Um, we've communicated, collaborated, shared equipment. And, you know, I think that has been a great blessing because we're one mile apart, you know, through this whole thing. I think it's been really great. And we're equally dedicated. Yep. So you've been listening to the Public Health Matters with our guests here, Andrea from uh, St. Jo Joe's and uh, Tim. I call you Tim. Yeah, absolutely. From Southern. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. As New Hampshire continues to combat COVID-19 and its variants, you can help do your part to prevent the spread of the virus. Wear a mask in public and obey any city, state, or federal ordinances. Keep socially distant where possible. Wash your hands often. And please get vaccinated along with your booster shot when recommended. We can stop this pandemic if we work together so we can all have a safe and healthy 2022.